Welcome back everyone, theCUBE's live coverage here at Open Source Summit 2023. I'm John Furrier, Rob Streche, breaking down all the content. We're kind of winding down day three. This is kind of where we bring in the community and start getting expert opinions and riffing on big problems, uh, big opportunities. We've got a great guest here, author, Lauren Maffeo, author, designing data governance from the ground up. Lauren, great to see you. Ran into each other yesterday. Yes. Um, from, from the Massachusetts area, like us, Boston area. That's why I'm here, let's be honest. <laughs> no, you're not here because of that. That was extra bonus points. Yeah. No, but mainly you're doing some cutting edge work. You wrote a book around data governance and designing it. Now more than ever, there's a lot more design and systems thinking going mm -hmm. into architectural decisions around data. Not just North America, but globally. Yeah. Rob, you, you're not foreign to data. Your last yeah. startup was you know, dealing with data. Let's get into it. What's the book about? real quick, and then we'll get into some of, the, some of the questions. Sure, so as you mentioned, I wrote a book and published it with the Pragmatic Programmers called Designing Data Governance from the Ground Up. The subtitle is Six Steps to Build a Data-Driven Culture, and I wanted to write this book because I have been in tech in some form or fashion for a decade, and I've been working directly and indirectly with organizations on data strategy and AI trends for the last seven years, first as an analyst at Gartner, and then now in my current full-time role as a service service designer at Steampunk, which is a human-centered design firm building design and technical solutions for the federal government in the US. And the common theme that I've noticed over the last seven years is that we as a society have moved very rapidly towards consuming and ingesting more data than ever. It is powering more AI types technologies than ever. But data maturity, seven years later, is still really at an all-time low. It's actually decreasing as the volume of data data that exists in the world increases very rapidly. And so when I was at Gartner, basically all of their thought leadership walked clients through the steps they would need to take in order to become a, a data mature organization, but in the four years that I was there, those numbers in terms of who is actually mature when it comes to managing their data didn't move. Then I became a practitioner where I was working with data architects and engineers to design systems, processes, services that would help ingest and share that data via various interfaces. And I was working with clients whose job it was to manage data in many cases and I was again, stunned to see that many of their processes were manual, they took days to complete, there was no automation, there was no process mapping, any of that, and so the workflows that were powering these da this data was still so inefficient, and I realized that being data-driven is really not a technical challenge, it's often framed that way, but it really is a cultural shift. And so when we talk about digital transformation, I think being data-driven is a huge part of it. I think there's a lot that we can learn from the security sec sector and how they have become cyber first, uh, but we're not there yet with data, and that's why I wanted to write the book. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting because I, I think one of the places that, uh, and again, my last uh, startup I was with was Snowplow, an open source, uh, platform for doing data collection, yeah. uh, first party data collection. And it ran into, and it was pretty much the alternative or one of the alternatives, uh, what they call a customer data platform built on things like the folks down here with the Data Lake technology or Snowflake or other databases that are out there. And I think you, you hit on something that's really important is that a lot of times, people have been collecting data, they've mm -hmm. either been using Google Analytics, which has more recently been outlawed in, I think it's up to six countries in yeah. the EU now. Mm -hmm. uh, and Google has really, has come out and basically said they have uh, no plans of being able to address the concerns of the EU to, to get past that. So mm -hmm. I think when you start to look at this and more and more data is being collected. Where is it being collected? Where is it being stored? Sovereignty. Sovereignty is a, a big, huge. big, yeah. huge problem. Because for instance, there's certain things within France where you actually have to keep your data for certain, if, even if you're an intergalactically large uh, commercial operation, you have to keep your data still in France about that, the right to be forgotten. And I think the GDPR yeah. stuff that's coming to the States is really interesting. And I, I guess my question, long way around, uh, is <laughs> from, it seems like data governance has started to pop up more and more. Is, are, are you finding that people outside the government are coming to you and really saying, hey, you know, 
we're trying to figure out how we do this and what's going on in Europe. What I see more than anything is people jumping on the AI bandwagon without, and they are so hyper-focused on the type of AI they want to deploy, which frameworks they're going to use, which you know containers they're going to yeah. use on the back end, and they are, that concept of who is consuming this data, how, which pipelines is it going through, none of, that is all an afterthought. I can't count the number of times I've heard people say, we will do, we'll do data governance later, we will, we will do you know, human centered design after deployment, and I die a little inside every time, because that, <laughs> my, my, it's my that? job it's to do that? Because they're lazy, things. they don't have the money, they don't have the expertise, what's uh, the reason? I think it ultimately goes back to what you touched on, which is data ownership. That is the biggest problem I see, especially when I'm promoting this book, people say, what is the biggest challenge with data governance? And it's that no one wants to, no one either wants to own anything, meaning they don't <laughs> want to own decisions about yeah. it, and they don't want yeah. to ascribe ownership to others. And so when I, we were talking right before we went live about how in the US we have, as citizens, no, basically no federally protected consumer rights when it comes to our data. And that's right very different when you look at citizens of Europe where they have many more rights uh, to their data. We are seeing in the US patchwork legislation coming up at the state level, like in California, Virginia is starting to do more. But in terms of the why, why don't people care? I think fundamentally, first of all, it is long work. It is long, it's a long game that you have to play. But right. the other thing is, I think there is, I think we're not lo looking at this as a human centered problem. I have my own bias in looking at it that way as a human centered designer. But the reality is that until we make that shift, I don't see things moving. Yeah, and I, I think it's really interesting is the fact that I think some some of these people, it's almost uh, it's almost better. They feel like uh, if I'm the ostrich with my head in the sand, uh, it's a little bit better because then I can ignore the fact that oh, I am collecting data mm -hmm. from certain countries that where GDP, GDPR now does apply to me, even mm -hmm. though I'm in the U.S. And I think that's uh, going to be a wake up call for a lot of these organizations when they start to realize that hey, we're using this AI technology. I'm, I'm working with another startup right now uh, where it's about how to find all the data and as ascribe business metrics and business value and metadata, not just file metadata to it so that you can do GDPR. Uh, in fact, we have a customer that's running this and doing that for that exact reason uh, because they use it for AI. And I, I think where they're a little bit ahead of the curve, but uh, they've done a lot more with uh, the European Union. So I, I think what what's interesting about, I think your book comes at a really good time well, too. The question that brings up is, is that on Amazon, for instance, I remember the, the days when cloud hit the scene. Yep. Everyone's like, they thought they were ready for the cloud. And then when the pandemic hit, the mm -hmm. people who needed the cloud the most, who weren't in the cloud, got hamstrung because they didn't have the core competency yep. or the muscle or ownership of understanding how cloud works. The people in the cloud, pivoted quickly, hey, we're agile. So right. I think this data ownership is like a problem, but, and, and the people who try to get into the AI business without having that, is like trying to do cloud without having expertise. So I think this AI is going to force everyone to the table, and, and I want to get your thoughts on how you see that happening, because what if someone says, hey, I've been pushing this data ownership, it's been that garbage, of the barge of <laughs> garbage that wouldn't land in New Jersey and was floating around. Remember that, remember that, 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 that yeah. no one wanted it. I don't want ownership, I'm going to get fired. I mean, it's a big task. It's yes. a, not a lot of love in that position. But then look at what happened in the past 10 years. Snowflake, mm -hmm. they don't like being called the data warehouse. Yeah. They want to be called the data cloud, but they're basically a data warehouse on the cloud. Yes. Data they, bricks, yes. same thing. Teradata, old school data warehouse, trying to get into the cloud. So this has to change. So what's your thinking and in, in how do you see the mechanisms of managing data, the software, the data infrastructure? What's teed up nicely for this next AI wave? And what kind of isn't? I think there is a lot of potential around the, the concept of data mesh architecture. So that is relatively new on the scene. Uh, it was founded uh, as a concept by Zemak Dagani at ThoughtWorks four years ago. It promotes a data as products mindset ra uh, where you have individual data domains that have clear owners and they are managed as products within a singular data lake that all hook up to one singular mesh catalog that is updated in real time. And then you hook up your consumer 
consumer apps to that mesh catalog so that it can consume apps and then or consume that data that is necessary and then put it out for users on the business side. I, I gave a BOF session on data mesh architecture yesterday at the OS Summit and we talked about the challenges of implementing it. The reality is that this is very new, nobody is an expert in it, it is costly to implement, that's mm. another big barrier for organizations yeah. today. It's, it's less about the tools that are available and it's more about making them cost, uh, less costly and scalable. As another example, I, I've helped a client implement AWS SageMaker for MLOps and they sell it as this super easy tool, you can just find your, your data set, you don't need to code, you don't need, to, need a PhD in stats, you can just go in, so I thought, I want to experiment with this. I'll set up a free trial and see what I can do. Y there is no free trial. Uh, it's co it costs the second you start using it. And so that is, of course, a big roadblock for yeah. anyone who does not have a large budget. So I think the technology, mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of innovation where we're not moving the needle is the governance part. And yeah. I what I would say is that the, your culture really determines the tech that comes into your organization. Yeah. So if you don't have that foundation of being data driven, you're yeah. not going to implement the right tools. Yeah. And I think the maturity curve is interesting. I, I'm discouraged to hear that the numbers are low, like are so bad uh, on the maturity side because we were riffing at KubeCon about the following aspiration, now aspirational fantasy, hallucination as we call it, <laughs> uh, here in the AI cube. We were riffing on the fact that Everyone's shifting left with security. Where are they shifting with data? Who, yeah. What if the developers decided where the data is stored? What, why should someone else decide the governance? What if the developers could have guardrails yep. like DevOps yep. for data? Which, what if the question? That's a good question, that flips the script. What if developers could decide where to store it? What would that look like? Yeah, my biggest takeaway from the conference this week is that I, it's amazing how much progress the open source community has made on security in the last five years. I was here at the same conference in Vancouver five years ago, and I don't remember anybody talking about security. I was a correspondent for opensource.com for several years, and when I would want to do news roundups talking about cyber breaches with open source, sometimes I was told, you know, our audience doesn't really want to read about that, which means they don't really want to address it. OpenSSF is very young, and yeah, so, but yeah. the fact that it exists five years later shows how much progress has been made on security. Yeah. So many talks at this conference have been about security, and I can't help but notice we have so much innovation in tech in, and data storage, in machine learning, all of this stuff, and yet we have we are yeah. really in the infancy of figuring out and nobody data wanted, and, and nobody wanted to talk about data at KubeCon. Remember we brought yeah. up AI? First of all, the sessions were put out the call for papers in November, so a little bit, they kind of, the way I wave hit hard in, in January, but they don't like think about data other than log files. No, like, I mean, we're I mean, so not there yet, and that's that has been a surprise to me again at this conference, I, the, and it's great to see the progress on security, but, but it really just hits home to me that we're still at the very infancy of figuring out what governance looks like, uh, even yeah. in open source, but I will say, I think there's no better model for how to be data-driven. Explain and, this concept. Go, of go ahead, being data-driven? Yeah, but it's open source, I know yeah. where you're going with this. Go yeah, ahead. so open source, I I feel like is bringing, it's about cross-functional collaboration, bringing people from various organizations, roles, skill sets together around a single vision to bring a project to life that is bigger than any one person. And I think that's no better model for how to implement data governance in an organization because there is too much data that exists today for yeah. one person or one team to own it. If you look at a typical enterprise, it's typically the CIO, they, data is one of many decisions they have have to make in their portfolio. They might have a CDO underneath them, but they might not. Mm -hmm. There, it is not going to subsist on having a top-down model where the CIO shop owns all of the data. You really need to. Or someone gets forced to take it. Everyone's like, who wants to own this? Oh, don't pick me. <laughs> Nobody you know, wants pick it. <laughs> and, and that's the thing, and I think the other thing that open source does well, I mean, there's a history of gamification. There's a history of rewarding people. And by the way, not rewarding them with money. I mean, I yeah. talk about this in the book about how you re if you want people to serve as stewards on your data governance council, you have to reward them in tangible ways. They have to be honored and compensated and promoted for the hard work that they are doing to bring this data governance to life because what's in it for them if they yeah. are 
left to do it, uh, and they're left holding the hard work without anything to show for so it. So Lauren, if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is that the open source has a track record of governance. Mm -hmm. And kind of could be hostile, by the way. Mm -hmm. Vendors want to come in and manipulate. As you go back old school, yeah. he's like, okay, we want to be pure, bottoms up, with a little bit of top down, maybe a little bit of benevolent dictatorship in there, but mostly community driven. Yes, community and advocacy and protection, sometimes at the expense of the bottom line with really difficult trade-offs, but no one, who does that better than yeah. people in open source? It's efficient, very efficient. Yeah. Diverse, efficient, yeah. scalable. Yes. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for an open data, you know, an open data project at the Linux Foundation uh, five years from now. Uh, who <laughs> knows who's going to lead it? But I, I see the writing on the wall. I think, you know, if we're talking five years from yeah. now, I hope that something like that has come to fruition. But what hit home for me here is that we're not there yet. And I was, I have never been to KubeCon in all uh, honesty. And I've, I've wondered what's the appetite for data there. Yeah. And uh, it sounds mm -hmm. like in Amsterdam it was pretty low. Well, you know, some of the thought leaders like. Justin Cormack at Docker, and we had Matt Butcher from uh, uh, the riffing on this idea of the developer, and they were both on the consensus of thinking, yeah, we could see why should someone else decide where the data is going to be stored if it's going to be developed on. So mm -hmm. we were riffing that chat GPT, which everyone kind of sees as the future, as an example, saying a prompt is essentially a call, that, and that gets yep. tuned, tuning is self-healing, so that scales with automation, so that, they understand automation. So their data view is, oh, it's a tool. So, I think that's going to be cool. I think they'll be fine with it, but right now they're more operational out of security is a big deal. They don't want hallucinations. They don't want to have any 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 uh, cracks in, in, in any kind of foundation. That being said, the conversation then shifted to AI is coming. And here, the conversation we've been having is: is the open source foundation, Linux Foundation, and all foundations prepared for the tsunami or tornado of AI? More velocity, mm -hmm. more volume, misinformation, more code. Yep. Is the foundation set up organizationally to handle this new next gen phenomenon with AI? What, what's your reaction to that? I can't think of a better organization that would be prepared for it purely because the Linux Foundation is founded as the home for all of these various open source projects that with contributors, with advisory councils, with leaders and GMs, and that is really what you need in order to build the, the bones of a really solid house when it comes to data. So I do think that when I look at who is doing this work, the someone like the Linux, Linux Foundation is, is perfectly positioned if there is the will and the interest in it. Um, and so I think that's a really great opportunity. It's interesting because we were talking in the BOF session yesterday about whether you're a startup and if that is a detriment to doing data governance because you either don't have the volume of data that others do, you don't have the staff that others do, and there are certainly barriers to being smaller in this space, but one of the really great benefits is that you don't have as much technical debt. You don't have as much bad data that you ha that is in your possession. You might not have consumed data for that long, which means that data destruction is not as big of an issue as it might be for other organizations. In other words, you might not have held on to data for five years past an expiration date, and now you have to worry about that. And that is a huge challenge for enterprises, is that they've been consuming all of this unchecked data for so long, the retroactive work to go in and fix it is huge. And I think that alone is a barrier for people. So designing data governance from the ground up, six steps to build a data-driven culture. Yes. What's the, been, been the biggest reaction from the book? What are some of the things people are saying? What's the reaction? I am really relieved to hear from practitioners who say I needed something like this because when I was pitching this book to the pragmatic programmers, it it was born from an idea. I was talking to Brian McDonald, who's an editor for Prag Prague at All Things Open in 2019 in Raleigh. A few about a year later, he very kindly made an intro to an editor at Prag Prague, and I gave the idea for the book. And they are a technical publisher. They they publish very niche technical books on Rust, Angular, all of these very specific topics, and the editor said, well, we'll take a look at this manuscript, but I don't know if people are going to be interested in this. And so whenever <laughs> I hear from <laughs> practitioners in data who are engineers, yeah or architects or CDOs and they say, this really resonated with me and this is what I've been trying to say for years with yeah. no luck, that feels really validating because it really it shows that this is a genuine challenge. It yeah. is something that, that leaders are concerned about. And I really wrote the book for people who say, 
I understand that I need governance. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what to do and I have very little yeah. time to figure it out. What are the six essential things I need to get started? So it was meant to be that primer yeah. because data governance is going to look very different depending on your tech stack, w whether you're in you know, Snowflake ver vers versus Databricks versus whatever, mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have a warehouse versus a data lake. So all of that is very nuanced, but you, there are fundamental things that every organization should be doing, yeah. and that was what this book was meant and, to and be. And data as code, which we've been calling it for years on theCUBE, is like infrastructure as code. At some point, it has to be programmable mm -hmm. and integrated in with code, and it has to be easy yep. for developers to interface with. Yes, yes. So you're going to see, we think data ops is a huge trend. It's yep. funny you mentioned about, some people might not like it. You know, I've been in a, a database business since I'm in college, and as one of my degrees, and, it's gone from, it goes from completely boring, no one cares, to the most sexy position. Yes. The best position, then it goes boring again. Then it comes, so like, it, it's boring until the next hot data topic. Now AI is the hottest thing, and that's data. Mm -hmm. Security's yep. a data problem, AI is a data opportunity, and now it's great to be a data geek. Yes, and I've gotten some bizarre reactions. When I say AI is, da is just data, People are people, including very intelligent people who have PhDs. Sometimes are like, "What are you? What are you talking about? Like, it's it's got its own consciousness. Like, it's going <laughs> to overtake us. All of this, all of this stuff." And I mean, that just goes to show there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what AI is in the first place. And until we create more literacy around it, we're yeah. not really going to move yeah. the needle. And I think what I'm afraid is going to move the needle is there's going to be some catastrophe with data. Yeah. If you look at why cyber advanced, why standards advanced, and secure yeah. pipelines advanced, it is because there was breach after breach after breach, and they're only getting yeah. worse, and the worst offenders of cyber breaches are internal employees, yeah. and so organizations were like, we can't afford not to do this anymore, yeah. and I do think that that's what's going to happen M with Matt data. Matt from Vermont was saying, we're in this weird moment of like just exploration and euphoria, and we said on theCUBE, there's going to be a plane in the Hudson moment Right. For, yeah. for data where people go, whoa. There is. And that's kind of, what's that going to look like? Catastrophe, some sort of event, mass murder. I mean, something has to happen. What I think is going to happen is that personally ide identifiable information is going to get leaked at, a, at such a massive scale that Every, all organizations will have no choice but to really take this seriously. I think, and if you, I read this article by a historian years ago that talked about how the arc of the universe bends towards progress following catastrophe, and that sounds very dark. severe yeah. and dark <laughs> until yeah. you, I looked at what he was yeah. talking about, and I thought, oh, that's actually true. Yeah. Um, and so then you think about tech and innovation yeah. in tech, innovation in cyber, in innovation in, in everything, it often follows an enormous problem and about, it's a problem to be solved. And you talk about rights, about financial, not having rights in data. We also don't have rights in cyber. The red line is, is we, we're being attacked yeah. under mm -hmm. the red line and just because there's no physical troops on our shores doesn't yeah. mean we're not being manipulated. There's, so we are, as citizens, very vulnerable. Very yeah. vulnerable, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one where it, it's going to be the catastrophe I think is already primed. I think yes. we're, we're in front of the wave and then the wave is coming. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the catastrophe potentially is going to be bankrupting of a company that gets fined for violating one of these large leaks yes. that happens. And I, I think that'll be a very interesting moment for all of these industries. And I, I think you also hit on a really good point which uh, I find very interesting in this community here and I'm, I'm there's not a lot of uh, product management of these projects. And I, I think it's, and I'm not talking, you know, scheduling and stuff like that, but it's more the, how they, some, some groups do a better job than others. And data product management has really become a big, yes. big topic. Yeah. Yes. Are you seeing that, that people are looking to you and saying, hey, where do you see this work well? Yeah. And, I am, I think, and I, I agree with you, and that's really what Data Mesh is all about. It's promoting a data as products mindset and that product management ethos to yeah. governing and managing your data as a consumable product, both by your colleagues and your customers. And the, the 
the point I always make is that there, there's no other role other than you know someone in a in a senior data role where it, like if you were a product manager and you said you know I'm gonna I'm gonna find figure out my product strategy after we ship or I'm gonna I'm a VP of sales and I'm gonna meet meet my have my sales strategy for inbound and outbound leads after the quarter's over. No one else is allowed to do that. And so when I hear people say, oh, we're going to come up with a data strategy including a governance plan later, it's Again, no one else is allowed to do that, and <laughs> so it's totally back backwards. Back, oh, we'll do that later. Yeah. Back up in recovery, we'll figure it out later, bolt right. on. Lauren, we got to go, great great chat. Congratulations yes. on the book. I'm glad you brought up Zamak. She was on our SuperCloud panel. She's now at Next Data. She started a new company, awesome. uh, the Data Mesh, uh, we're big fans of. So yes. uh, let's keep in touch, let's follow up, and congratulations on the book. Thank you very much. Okay, this is theCUBE. Day three coverage wrapping up soon. We'll be right back with more. I'm John Furrier, Rob Strecce. Stay tuned.